All right, today's class may be the uh, the day you've really been waiting for. We're going to do some exploratory data analysis, you might call it, to think about the model we were looking at last Thursday based on data uh, of home values, based on we got the price, we got the square footage, we got the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the number of cars that the garage can hold, and that kind of thing. And we want to try to approach this using technology as much as we can. We'll start with spreadsheets and then we'll move to the basics of R. Now, you don't know much about R. I actually don't know much about R. We're going to do a little just exploration with the kinds of things that you can do in R at a real basic level based on what we've learned from the that two hour long video that I shared with you. So let's start by looking at the data again in a spreadsheet, the home price data. So we had observation number in the first column. That was just the house number, you might call it. I think there were 504 data points that we might we might want to just double check that here. 504 data points. Okay, that's right here. That's the number of observations. We have the price of the house. We have the square footage, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, number of cars the garage can hold. And you can see many of these have zero meaning effectively there's no garage, which you know is the case in sometimes in cities and older neighborhoods. Sometimes they have alleyways and they do have garages in their alleyway, but sometimes they don't. And the zip code, which is really more of a categorical variable, right? It's hard to give meaning to this. This is the last digit of the zip code, but it does relate to an area in the city. And so could conceivably could be a, an informative categorical variable. Last Thursday, we created the summary output for the multiple regression model, multiple linear regression, and we got these coefficients. So this is the intercept, negative 30,783. That's going to be the constant term in the regression equation. These are the coefficients for these different variables. We call these x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. Might be better today to just use the variable name uh, the label, you might say, as the variable name. So let's go ahead and write down the equation that we get from this using these numbers from the regression output. The regression equation, the multiple regression equation that we get from these 504 data points, a moderately large data set, and the variables that we used is y hat is approximately negative 30,783.4, maybe we'll go to one place after the decimal for all these, plus 82.8 times x1, meaning square footage. I'll just abbreviate that uh, SF, put a dot in there for multiplication. SF is the number of square feet. The number of bedrooms gets multiplied by minus 7,454.8. So we have a minus 7,454.8 times, you could call it bed for number of bedrooms. The number of bathrooms you can see has a coefficient of positive 22,255.9. That gets multiplied by the number of bathrooms. Uh, the garage is really, again, the number of cars that can fit in the garage. I'm going to switch that name to uh, be car instead of gar garage. 9325.5 times car. And then, yes, even though zip code is a categorical variable, we are giving it a numerical value, and it does come up with a coefficient in the regression equation of negative 303.5 times zip, let's say. So it's a little strange to put a categorical variable into an equation, but people do do it. You can, in this case, give it a numerical value, even though it doesn't have much meaning. It does affect the model. It does affect how the equation gets used. So this is our multiple regression equation that we could use given a, a house that has a known square footage, a known number of bedrooms, a known number of bathrooms, a known number of cars that the garage can hold, if any, and the known last digit of the zip code, plug the numbers in there to get your prediction for the price of the house, okay? However, 
though we can do this, you might say it's not really ideal. Coefficients, slopes, you might call them, rates of change should make sense. Now the square footage coefficient does make some sense. It's a positive coefficient of about 82.8. Think of that as a rate of change. What is that telling you? That's telling you the rate of change of the price with respect to square footage is about $82.8 per square foot. These numbers, the units for the price are in dollars and the units for the square footage are in square feet. The interpretation of that coefficient would be that the rate of change of price, Y is price, with respect to square footage is about $82.8 per square foot. <clears throat> For each extra, what does that mean? For each extra square foot that your house is, you would expect the price to go up by about $82.8. Probably it would be a little bit more easy to understand if you convert this to a price rate of change in dollars per maybe 100 square feet or something. Effectively, you can multiply this by 100 since there's um, 100 square feet and 100 square feet. <laughs> you multiply it by 100, move the decimal point to the right by two places to get the rate of change of the price increase in dollars per hundred square feet is what I'm trying to say here. So ever, for every extra hundred square feet, you could estimate the price to go up by about that much. Probably that's too many significant digits. Probably you should round that to just 8,000 say, or maybe even 10,000. For every extra hundred square feet, expect the price of the house to go up by in the ballpark of $10,000. That's how you'd interpret that. However, there's a problem. Is this really a good interpretation? For example, if you go on to like the number of bedrooms, the coefficient's negative. How can that be? For each extra bedroom, expect the price to go down by about $7,500? That doesn't make any sense. The more bedrooms there are, the more you expect your house to be worth. What's going on here? What's going on here is that when you do a multiple regression, there are what are called collinearities or multilinearities between the variables. The variables themselves are correlated. Like if you got a bigger house, you'd expect not only more square footage, but also more bedrooms. And because of that, it means when you put these things together, you can get weird things like that and it becomes harder to interpret the coefficients. This is the overall multiple regression based on these five explanatory or predictor variables. It is going to do a good job overall, but because of those collinearities, it makes it tougher to interpret the regression coefficients as rates of change. They are rates, appropriate rates of change within this model. But that does not mean if you build an extra bedroom on your house that your the value of your house is going to go down. So it's kind of an art form. Yes, we're going to try to make it scientific, you might say, to some degree. But it is kind of an art form in figuring out what the best model is. And in, in reality, this ultimately means there's really no best model. Models are always either bad, okay, or decent. They're, they're never perfect, okay? You're, you're shooting for decent, decently good models. And yes, we have some decision criteria that we can use to help us decide what model to use, but it's never an exact science. That's actually a good thing. 
What it means for you is something real practical. It means, yes, job security, right? As long as you don't do a bad job, as long as you do a decent job, you can always take your models and you can always try to make them better. If nothing else, based on changing market conditions, you can try to make them better or with houses based on different locations, different zip codes, different cities, that kind of thing. You can always work to make your models better. Okay, so it does mean to some degree some job security as long as you're not doing a bad job. So let's go back, let's take a step back and let's get rid of this multiple regression output in the spreadsheet. I'm gonna just delete it all. What should we do instead? How should we approach pretending we are working for say Zillow or some real estate company. Zillow, you know, they keep track of home values. They use regression. They, they use more than regression, but that's part of what they use. And you're trying to build a model for Zillow ba based on a certain town or something, okay? They, they say, oh, the model that we've been using for this town hasn't been working very well. It's your job to try to fix it. What should you do? In one hour, we don't have time to do it all. Okay, let's try to do some basic things. The first thing you really should do is some exploratory data analysis. What does that mean? Well, for one thing, you should think about these individuals, these variables individually. You should make graphs for one thing, like histograms. Like we can make a histogram for the price. Actually, I should have practiced this ahead of time. Is there a way to choose the entire column real quickly without scrolling? I guess I can click on, okay, here we go, yeah. Click on the B, the column B for the price, insert chart, will it pick a histogram? Let's see. Nope, it didn't. There we go, there's a histogram. There's a histogram of the price. I find Google Sheets works nicer this way when you try it on Excel, at least when I've tried it on my Mac Excel, it doesn't necessarily pick a histogram and it sometimes seems hard to find an appropriate way to get a histogram unless you're using some other tool. So there's a histogram of the price. So what do we have here? For this first category, Prices between 50,000 and 86,400 approximately. There are 69 homes, right? There's 504 homes overall. So we've got 69 homes in the first price category that the spreadsheet picked for me. Got the largest number, 146 homes in the second category going from about $86,400 to $122,800. Got 103 in the next one, et cetera. And what are we seeing here? We are seeing a tip, a pretty typical looking histogram of home prices. It's right skewed. That's what you would expect. And there is evidently one very large outlier. <clears throat> Outliers are definitely something to pay attention to. And you might argue in a situation where you're trying to build a regression model, maybe they should be ignored. I'm not gonna ignore them just for the sake of simplicity, but maybe if you're trying to build a predictive, predictive regression model for home prices based on various variables, explanatory or predictive variables, maybe you should ignore the outliers because they are really special cases. Maybe you should build a separate model for outliers effectively you know, mansions, you might call them. Is that really a mansion? Well, not necessarily in today's market. Certainly not a mansion in like a town like San Francisco, whose distribution would be a lot different. But for this town, maybe it is a mansion. It's not normal. It is right skewed. And there is a, a pretty extreme outlier. That definitely affects things. Definitely affects the regression model. 
So where we won't delete the outlier, but keep that in mind. We can also do summary statistics for the price, price summary stats. So we can compute the mean and standard deviation, for example. We can also compute the five number summary. I like making max in all capital letters, max, third quartile say, median, first quartile, and minimum. I like making that all lowercase just for fun. The numbers for the price are in column B, B2 through B505. So the mean would be equals average. There we go. That would be the, the mean price. Let's take a guess as to what it would be looking at the histogram. Remember the fact that it's right skewed is gonna pull the average to the right. The average, the mean is gonna be bigger than the median for sure. It is the center of mass, which is, it's tough to guess exactly for sure. Do I have a ball care park guess? I'm guessing somewhere in the 100 or 200 thousands. How's that, how's that for a, a ballpark guess? Perhaps, perhaps around 200,000, let's see. 158,000, okay. Standard deviation. Use the sample standard deviation. Don't add a P on top of that. Just equals STDEV, B2 through B. 505, about 87,000. Most of the data is gonna be within two standard deviations of the mean. Two times this is about 175,000. Yeah, take away two standard deviations from that, you're below zero. Add two standard deviations to that, you are at about 325,000, bringing us right around there in the spreadsheet there in the, in the uh, histogram. Max is equals max. Third quartile is equals quartile. And then put a comma three. Median is equals median. You can also do equals quartile and a comma two if you prefer. The median will be smaller than the mean, perhaps 130 or 140 something, 100, close to 130. First quartile, comma one, and then minimum. It does look like these things are ordered by price. So the minimum will be that top one of 52,900. I guess not. There must be some one that's out of order or something. That's a bit strange. I don't know what quite happened there. It doesn't look like any of these is 52,000. Oh, there, there's some out of order, right? There we go. That, okay, okay, I'm seeing what's going on. So these are ordered by price, but also within the category of the number of cars the garage can hold, I guess because we're in the starting with uh, observation number 44, we're on to one car garages from cars that have, from houses that have no garages to one car garages. So I guess that's how it's ordered, okay? What else could we do in exploratory data analysis? Well, something else is you can make histograms for the other things, the square footage, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, number of cars the garage can hold. However, realize that while price and square footage are effectively continuous, you might say, certainly the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and the number of cars the garage can hold are better described as discrete random variables. So if you make a histogram for those, it's not a histogram in the usual sense, it's more of an ordinary kind of bar chart. You're not really looking at the shape of the distribution so much in those cases in the usual sense. I will not take the time to do that. In Excel, at least, we will do it in R to a degree. But let's at least make one scatter plot here in the spreadsheet. If I highlight column B and column C,
oops, there we go, and insert a chart. It doesn't pick a scatter plot. We got to pick a scatter plot. There we go. <clears throat> um, it is putting the price in the horizontal axis, whereas we'd probably prefer the price in the vertical axis because we're trying to predict price from square feet, for example. It's not that you can't look at the graph this way. However, if you were, if you get the regression line from this, if we added the regression equation to this, it would be a regression equation for predicting square footage from the price, which is the opposite of what we want. Uh, I haven't practiced this ahead of time, but I'm assuming there's a way to switch around the rows and the, the columns here. Perhaps in the series. I should have practiced this ahead of time. And set up. The data range maybe somehow change that. Or the series here. Okay, let's give that a try. Did it work? Uh, don't want that. It was worth trying. So I didn't try this ahead of time. Let's do this. Let's get rid of that chart and do it in a not, not ideal way. Let's just copy and paste the columns here and switch them around. I'll put the square footage here and the price here and do it based on that. Oops. Paste the entire column. There we go. All right. Um, hmm. Yeah. Change to a scatter plot. There we go. Now we'll be predicting price from square footage, which is probably the most reasonable thing to attempt at first if we're after a simple linear regression model, right? Does that make sense? If you're after probably the simplest model you can come up to predict the price, probably your easiest thing to pick is the square footage as your predictor variable. Let's add the trend line, which is the regression line. Let's show the value of R squared and also show a label for the equation. If we only use the square footage to predict the price, then our slope has become close to 100. Whereas in the model, the, the multiple regression model that I, that I deleted, the coefficient of the square footage was about 83, 82.8. Right there. Which one's right? Well, realize there's really no right answer. There's no exact right answer. For one thing, this takes all the coefficients, all the variables into account, this model. This is your best estimate for the rate of change of square footage with price with respect to square footage, taking all the variables into account. And this is your best estimate for the rate of change or price with respect to square footage, taking only square footage into account. Okay. The other thing that's going on is we've got a sample, right? We're trying to estimate a population rate of change of price with respect to square footage based on a sample. Different samples will give you different estimates, right? Fundamental thing in statistics. The estimators have, are random variables. They have sampling distributions, as I've emphasized over and over again. There's the outlier. That affects things as well. Though, one positive thing that I see with that outlier is it's still within the overall trend, it seems. It's not an outlier, say, way up here or way down here. So that's at least one positive thing about the outlier is something you can look for. What's the value of R squared in this case? 0.782, 78.2, fairly high. Not as high as you might hope for, but fairly high. It's a fairly strong linear trend. You might say, and this is important, what I'm about to say, about 78.2% of the variability in the prices 
is explained by the regression equation. That's the way you say it. You might want to write that down. For this particular model of predicting the price just in the square footage, the fact that R squared is about 78.2%, 0.782 means what? Here's what to write down. Means that about 78% of the variability in the prices is explained by the amount of square feet. That's what people say. What else explains the variability in the prices? The, what's the other 22% or so? That's natural variation about the regression model. Residuals, effectively, the randomness for them from the residuals. Let's go ahead and just see what happens if we do the um, Excel Miner Analysis Tool Pack here. I'll put the output starting in N37. So remember N37 here. Okay, so do the Excel Miner Analysis Tool Pack. Linear regression. I'm going to include the labels, the Y range. We're trying to predict price. Click the labels box. It's going to be L1 through L505. Um, and the X range is going to be K1 through K505. I will go ahead and look at the residuals, residual plots. Pro uh, probably the plots is good enough. We won't look at the actual residuals. And I'll put the output starting in cell N37. So for this model, predicting price based on square footage, slope again was close to 100. The intercepts about negative 24,500. That's hard to interpret because that would be saying, What's the price when there's no square footage? Well, of course, there's no house that has zero square footage. It's not a house. Tiny houses are a separate category, okay? We built a different model for those. We do see the p-values are very small. What are those p-values for? Remember, the null hypothesis is that the coefficient, the population coefficient is zero versus the alternative that is non-zero. These are always two-sided, two-tailed p-values. Very, very close to zero. We've got strong evidence that these coefficients are non-zero. And more informative, perhaps, are the confidence intervals, the 95% confidence intervals to estimate beta zero with this one and beta one with this one. And here's your residual plot. And yeah, effectively random scatter above and below zero. Although one thing that's not ideal, you might say, that doesn't quite fit the regression model is that the amount of variability in the residuals doesn't stay constant. You can see it's smaller variability for low square footage for small houses and higher variability when houses get bigger, which you might expect. What's saying is that the models not, the, the data are not fitting the model perfectly. And that, that hardly ever happens actually in real life is the, the data fit the model perfectly, fit the assumptions of the model. at least we're seeing pretty random scatter above and below. And we could do other comparisons. We could compare price to the number of bedrooms. We could compare price to the number of bathrooms or the number of cars the garage can hold. We could even put the zip in the model like we did before. But how do you decide what to use? What to use? It'd be nice if we could at least do a little bit of multiple regression here, at least have a couple explanatory variables. Hmm. Let's get these data into R now. And let's see what benefits R has for doing what we've done so far compared to the spreadsheet. So I've got, let's see here, my R Studio. And if you haven't practiced this yet, well, you may just need to watch what I do. Let's create a new R script file. I'm going to file, new file, R script. That's this window up here in the upper left. 
And let's go ahead and load the spreadsheet data. Now, just like with Mathematica, I have the spreadsheet data on my computer based on my folder structure. The data happens to be right there. I did show you, you can load the, uh, the files this way. You also can load the files, import the file this way through the file menu, import data set from Excel, for example. I'll do that this time. If it doesn't work for you, maybe it's because you didn't go back to that, uh, that website I, I shared with you a few weeks ago that you that I had to look at to fix mine where mine wasn't working. Can browse for the file. So I'm going through my folders to find it here. There it is right there. There it is. So it gives you a preview of what we saw in the spreadsheet. It is making the assumption that all these variables are a double data type, essentially numerical. It would be good to certainly convert the zip to a character, more of a categorical variable, so that R knows it should be treated as categorical. You can make the change right there. Also, you could say the observation number is more of a character as well. And you can leave the other ones as doubles. I mean, you could convert them to numeric as well, but double is a numerical data type. There we go. Uh, this is actually just a preview of the first 50 entries, not all 504 of them, not all 505 rows if we include the uh, the labels for the data. This would be what you call a data frame in R. So I loaded it through the file uh, import data set menu. You also, they show you the code preview, could load it with that code. So essentially, it's the read Excel command that is going to load the Excel file with this file path, uh, giving names to the columns, well, giving a numeric types of data there, and then viewing it, you can see what we're seeing up here. But I'll just do the click import here, and there we go. So it's in there, as you can see in this environment thing, it's labeled home price data. And effectively, it did the, the code here by clicking on import. What can we do with it? One thing we could do is we could try to make plots. Could I just do plot? Home price data? Yeah, you can. What are we going to get? There's so much data. And there's so many variables. Let's just see. On a Mac, do control return. We get a bunch of plots over here. And R, by default, is picking what it thinks the, is the best plot in each case. Notice along the main diagonal of this matrix of plots, you got the variable names, observation number, price, square footage, bedrooms, bath, garage, and zip. How do you interpret each plot? For example, to predict price when you know square footage, it's this plot, right? The square foot label here is underneath this axis on, in this plot, and the price label is next to the vertical axis. This would be a scatter plot showing you, without a regression line, showing you predicting price from knowing square footage. And you see a positive linear trend there, just like we saw in the spreadsheet. If instead you want to predict the price from the number of bedrooms, there's bedrooms, that's this plot right there. That's not labeling the axes. Evidently, there's only one house with one bedroom, I'm assuming. This is the two bedroom houses, this is the three bedroom houses, four and five bedroom houses. 
not a typical looking scatter plot. That makes sense. Your number of bedrooms is very discrete, right? You can only have a whole number of bedrooms. Of course, square footage and price are technically discrete as well, but it, from a modeling standpoint, it's better to model them as continuous. So you should expect to see these things stacked on top of each other. You can still do regression with this. We can still build a regression model with this particular kind of scatter plot. And you might say in some ways it even more closely matches what goes on in the model of regression because we do have for any individual X value, except the first one, lots of Y values. The regression line probably would look about like this. And it'd be better to use it to estimate the mean price for any given number of bedrooms. Could we regress bedrooms on the price? If you know the price, could you predict the number of bedrooms? Uh, I guess that would be this plot here. Does that make sense? No. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, no, it is that plot. The price would be along the horizontal axis because it's below the price label there. And the bedrooms would be along the vertical axis now. And now we have stacks going horizontally. You could try to predict the number of bedrooms based on the price. That's kind of a weird one over here. What's going on there? Well, that's because these are all kind of weird here because the horizontal axis is the observation number. Observation numbers go one through 504. This, the, this little piece that I put that graph, I think was the first 44, right? These are the ones with uh, zero, no garage, right? Zero was the garage um, car there. That was just the way the spreadsheet data was organized. The first 44 had zero for the garage, meaning no garage. This must be the group that has one car garages. This must be two car garages. This must be three car garages. You wouldn't know that just looking at the R output here, but we knew looking at the spreadsheet that was the way it was. And here you're trying to predict price from the observation number, which effectively is the number of garages. That's effectively the same as this graph over here, below the, above the garage. The reason this one, they're, they're stacked is because the horizontal axis is garage zero, one, two, or three. Whereas these are curved because we're using the observation number on the horizontal axis. But it really is the same data. So this is a definite benefit of R here. A bunch of graphs all at once. When you're doing exploratory data analysis, as long as you feel comfortable looking at this, it gives you a quick feel for the data. And it does give you a quick feel that ignoring the zip code one, all these trying to predict price from square footage, bedrooms, bathrooms, and number of garages individually have a positive linear trend. The regression line is going to have a positive slope that could be interpreted in an ordinary kind of way. What about the collinearity, also called multilinearity issue? Are there positive correlations between, for example, square footage and number of bedrooms? The two graphs to look at would be these two. Both of those, you can see, you can just look at the graph, do have a positive slope to the regression equation. So that is some collinearity. Going back to the spreadsheet, yeah, there's a correlation between, <clears throat> say, square footage and price, as we'd expect, but there's also a collinearity between explanatory variables like square footage and bedrooms. I could do equals corel. C2 through C505, comma D2 through D505. It's going to be a positive correlation. Its square is not super big. Square of that is less than 0.5. So it's not as strong of a collinearity between those explanatory variables as, it, as you might guess at first. I probably would have guessed higher. That's actually, in a sense, a good thing if you would like to build a multiple regression model. 
long as r squared between these two explanatory variables is not too high, like not above 0.8, say, that's an indication that it's not a bad idea to perhaps include them both in a multiple regression model. Make sense? They are, in a sense, somewhat independent of each other, at least. I mean, yes, there is a relationship, but it's not strong enough to, say, completely avoid using them in a multiple regression model, them both. So let's do that now, actually. First, let's do it in the spreadsheet. Let's now do a multiple regression model where we use both square feet and bedrooms. We're trying to build up a multiple regression. And so what you might say is an ideal multiple regression model. In the spreadsheet, so let's delete this, this output here. Um, I'll still leave the graph here. That's got the regression equation there and the R squared there. I'll go ahead and delete the residuals there too. But that's now again in cell N37, get XL minor analysis tool pack output when we try to use both square footage in bedrooms, but not Baz garage or zip. And let's see if we get positive coefficients for the um, square footage in bedrooms or not, or if one of them unfortunately happens to become negative. So we're going to put it in N37 again. Okay, let's see. XL minor. Labels box, by range is the price in column B. Make sure to include the label. X range includes both square footage and bedrooms. So I'd put C1 colon D505 here. N37 for that, which it already is. Okay, let's just click okay now. There it is. Unfortunately, one of the coefficients still became negative. The bedroom coefficient became negative. It would not be negative if it was by itself. I'm almost positive. I mean, if you look at this, this output here, If you're just looking at using, why is that in zooming? Did I already have that window open? There it is, okay. If you're just using at, if you're using bedrooms to predict price, it's this particular scatter plot here, that is gonna have a regression line with a positive slope. So, I mean, this, this happens in real life, okay? This kind of thing that I'm encountering does happen in real life. You get negative regression equations, uh, coefficients, when you would hope they'd both be positive, for example. And when you, when you only use a single explanatory variable, they are both positive. Because when you're looking at the two variables together, it's including them both in the entire model. It is, po uh, it is nice to see that the square footage one is still close to 100. That's making me feel more confident that that's kind of more robust, that the rate of change of price with respect to square footage is pretty close to $100, $100 per square foot or $10,000 for every 100 square feet. And yeah, the p-value is very small. The p-value for the bedroom one's not very small. We don't have strong evidence that the number of bedrooms coefficient is non-zero. And yeah, the confidence interval includes both positive and negative numbers. And it's very large. Whereas the confidence interval for the slope, the intercept, excuse me, the rate of change of the price with respect to square footage is a fairly small interval. So yeah, I'm including bedrooms in here, but it's not, it's not an ideal thing. Maybe you'd want more data to fix it, but you know, this is a moderately large data set of 504 data points. You, you kind of wouldn't expect this to be so large just going into this ahead of time. This kind of thing happens in real life. That's why this is 
a mixture of an art form and science theory. It's art and science at the same time. Overall, the model is doing a good job. This F statistic is very large and the p-value is essentially zero. Remember this thing measures the overall model. What are we really testing there? This is discussed in the reading. The F statistic that we're looking at in the ANOVA output is this F statistic on page 474. Let me remind you how that's computed. In the spreadsheet, this is computed first by computing these SSs. This is SSYY, SST for total as well, it's called. That's SSE because it's next to the word residual. It's in that row. This last time we called SSR, and effectively you can just define SSR to be this number minus this number so that both of these add up to this one. It's the fact that this is fairly large compared to this that makes the R squared value closer to one than to zero. R squared, in fact, does equal this number divided by this one. I can confirm that here. Yep, that equals R squared. You should know these things for the take home exam. These numbers are called mean square numbers. They are the corresponding S, S on that same row divided by the corresponding DF. So this number is this one divided by two. This number is this one divided by 501. And the F statistic is this number divided by this number. Like this. Yep, that's the 899.858. And that ratio is what's done right here in the book, page 474. SSR divided by K. is this 299, whatever that is, trillion or something, divided by two. K is two, there's two explanatory variables here. This is SSE divided by what's 501, that's N minus K minus one. N is 504, K is two, 504 minus two minus one is 501. SSE divided by N minus K minus one. That thing is the same as S squared. You can also write the formula this way. This gives an F statistic, has an F distribution, whose numerator degrees of freedom is K, which in our case is two, and whose denominator degrees of freedom is N minus K minus one, which in our case is 501. You could look up p-values in the back of the book or trust that this p-value, yes, is correct essentially zero. Yes, this is a very extreme F statistic. We definitely have evidence to reject this null hypothesis that beta one and beta two are zero versus the alternative that one or the other of them is non-zero. This regression model overall is statistically significant. But is it quite ideal? It doesn't, I think, again, the fact that this is negative is still kind of making this not ideal. Again, we could regress the price on the number of bedrooms and we would get a positive slope, but I won't take the time to do that. So we continue exploring. Let's go back to R. How? So these are a bunch of scatter plots that R decided to make. Let me also show you that you can make histograms of individual data in this on um, down here if i do this code hist and do the home price data and then put a dollar a dollar sign it gives me the option of making a histogram for one of these variables say the price we already did that in a spreadsheet this makes a histogram 
of the price data. You can relabel this axis if you want, if you're interested in how. Going to the files from that two hour long video and opening up the one that's labeled with histogram gives you code for how to label the axes, for example. Um, it's X lab means X label. You can color it different ways as well. This is a main label. Don't worry about the rest. Maybe you don't even need to include them. Maybe I should add some of these here. Let's just see what happens in the file that we're working with. Um, I think I have to put that inside histogram though. Yeah, let me redo it. Let's see. get rid of that. Let's do hist again. Let's try this. And I think you have to enter each line individually. Uh, get rid of this. It's not letting me. Okay, it's not letting me delete it once it's been entered. Let's add a label in here. Price. Okay, it didn't like it. Um, not sure quite what the problem is yet. It's saying unexpected equal sign. Seems like I'm using the correct syntax. Wonder if it'd be better to put, try to put it up here. That's the script file, but or maybe let's try making a new file, this untitled one. Let's try this. Okay, still got the errors. I don't know if these plus signs could possibly be the problems. Okay, so I was trying to mimic what they did in that other file. Oh, maybe because I forgot. It looks like I forgot the the dollar sign here in price. There we go. Maybe that's one thing. Okay, that that's better. Still getting some sort of errors here. It looks like, but at least we're getting a, a zoomed in graph. What about the re regression? I did show this to you once. So here's the other videos, one of the, the, the regression file. I think you do have to load these packages. And to tell you the truth, I'm not sure if it looks like works like Mathematica, whereas every time you open our studio, you have to run this or not. Let's just see what happens. Okay, let's try going back here. And let's see. I wonder if we can do this kind of thing. Here's one way to assign a quantity to a variable with an, a backwards arrow like this. I'd like X to include, well, let's just try it with uh, square footage to keep it simple. Let's see if this works. Enter this. Has X been entered? It says error, unrecognized response. Let's see how it's done in this file here. Okay, let's, this kind of thing. Okay, let's see if we can copy and paste this kind of thing. I'm gonna create a new variable like they do here called data. And looks like we the entire data frame can get stored in that. Okay, that's good. And you see over here, it's got 405, 504 observations of seven variables. And I could do this kind of thing. I'm going to copy and paste this. 
And what the minus 12 here did in the video, the two hour long video, is it got rid of the, um, the Y coordinate effectively in the data, which is the home price. Uh, let's see. That's in our third column here. So I'm guessing maybe we need a minus three because it's the third column. If I just type an X here, will I see it? I do, I see, and these are observation number here. This is prices. But I wanted to get rid of the price. So that's not good. Looks like bedrooms, bathrooms, garage, and zip. So we did not end up getting the price, getting rid of the price by doing that. That's what I was hoping the minus three would do because the price was in the third column. We got the, or is it in the second column? We got the observation number, the price in the second column. Maybe I should have done it with a minus two. Did it get rid of the square footage though? It didn't, doesn't, okay, it, okay, it looks like it got rid of the square footage. That's good. Okay, so let's go minus two instead of a minus three. Now it got rid of the prices. So this observation number here, Square footage, this column, bedrooms, bathrooms, cars, zip. It got rid of the price. That's what I want. And then the Y is going to be the actual price itself. So that one, a, a three, a two there. You leave this blank effectively saying, don't include the other columns. Only include column two, which is where the price is. Yep, these are prices. And then to do regression, mimic this, do this kind of thing. That's gonna do a regression. LM stands for linear model. To predict Y when you know X, to predict the price when we know the square footage. Actually more than that. X is gonna include all the data except for the price. So this is actually going to predict why the price when we know not only the square footage, but also the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the number of cars the garage can hold in the zip code. It seemingly didn't do anything, but like Mathematica, it did. To see some output, we can do summary. That's going to give well, or just pre, just doing this will do the coefficients only. You see with this comment here. So these, oops, getting an error. Why didn't reg one not get stored? Invalid frame. Hmm. So maybe. Maybe the problem is the label being in there as well. Drop unused levels true. Invalid type list for the variable Y. Y is the prices. X is this and it does include the labels. I, I, I at least like to get rid of the labels, I think too. Wonder if doing a minus one colon two, I think that might might get rid of both columns, one and two. Let's see if that works. Nope, that seemed to be invalid syntax. Okay, so we're going to have to explore a little bit with this to get it get the bugs out. We're out of time, but it looks like if you play around, you could try playing around with it on your own. If you do a summary. You get an infer infer inferential test, in other words, p-values for whether the regression coefficients are zero or not. Here you can get the ANOVA table. Here you can get, for example, confidence intervals for the coefficients, get residuals, that kind of thing, make histograms of the residuals. That file that you can download from that two hour long video is something that you can play with. And I would encourage you to play with, I will play with it before Thursday to try to do this regression with R. Okay, have a good day.